this year what we decided to do was just to have an open evening and to have questions and answers instead of preparing a particular topic. Many of you have sent in questions and we have about 50 questions here. So uh, if you want to ask a question, <coughs> feel free to do that. Otherwise, you know, we can look at these. If you want to ask a question though, don't hesitate. You know, we want this to be open and have some back and forth. Uh, so feel free. <coughs> um, let's begin with the questions. Okay, so that, that's not going to work. No, let me see. Where, where do you have? Okay, I think I'm, maybe I'll have to read the questions. Yeah, because or we can give Ismail the mic and. Can yeah, no, if, if give Ismail the mic, then then we can do it. <coughs> come, come and sit here. So Dr. Omar, the first question is, how is economic inequality slash injustice looked at from an Islamic perspective? Mm -hmm. um, in Hadith Jibreel, the angel Gabriel comes to the Prophet Wasallam, <coughs> and this is at the very end of the Medinan period and the companions see him, which indicates to you how great the companions are. And he asks the four questions. What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And then when will the hour be? <coughs> and that last question, when he asks it, the Prophet said, لَيْسَ الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ That the one who's asked this question namely the Prophet وسلم, is not more knowledgeable than the one asking it, namely Gabriel. So the knowledge of the hour is just for God alone. And you can't figure it out. You can't triangulate it. So then he says, وَمَا أَشْرَاطُهَا So what are its signs? <clears throat> and among its signs is that the maid servant will give birth uh, to her mistress or to her master. In other words, and that has different meanings, but one of them is that children will be like masters and mothers will be like slaves. That's one of the standard meanings of it. And then that you see the barefoot, naked, poor Bedouins, herders of sheep and camel, camels, competing with each other in building tall buildings. That's the second one that he gave. So <clears throat> all of these signs of the end of time and all negative signs of the end of time, because you also have positive ones, they all indicate fundamental injustice and disorder and the breaking up of the immutables, the things that are not supposed to change. So why would a child treat their mother as a slave? Because they're not properly educated, because they're not taught <coughs> the honor of the mother and the father, and because they're not taught other things as well. So they become the kind of children that we actually see in my country all the time who treat their mother as if she were worse than a slave and curse at her and make her cry and you get this for me and you get that for me and they're never thankful for anything. So <clears throat> this is um, breaking up the immutables. So the way that elders are supposed to be treated and parents are supposed to be treated, that's not happening anymore. So you have a big problem with education and with tarbiya. And then you have Bedouins, barefoot, naked, um, poor, competing with each other and building tall buildings. Like you see in Riyadh, and you see in Dubai, and you see in Doha, and you see in these other countries. Okay, so what does that mean? It means economic injustice and political injustice. Because how did all of this money 
come to be concentrated in so few hands. You see? So that means you have another immutable which has been changed, which is social and political and economic justice. So that's what Islam tells us about these things that we're asked about. And <clears throat> there, there, we have an obligation to establish social, political, and economic justice. Are we able to do that? Well, we're in an extremely difficult situation today. But <clears throat> we have to do the best that we can do with what we have, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. And we have to understand the time we live in. But we see the Bedouins competing in the building of tall buildings. And in my country, you see children treating their, their parents, you know, worse than slaves. <clears throat> uh, in Islam, um, justice and a sound political system is one of the greatest prizes of all. But as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the signs of the end of time, that Islam would be taken apart, Urwa, Urwa. You know, one rung, one rung or not hold by another. And the first to go would be the hukum. The first would be political rule. And the last to go would be salat. So, you know, we have the salat, alhamdulillah. We have the fast, alhamdulillah. Um, and we desire social, political, and economic justice. And may God give us that. But that's a very tall order in bad times. And you have to do the best that you can do with what you've got. Uh, shall we take the next question? <coughs> can you please tell us about the signs of the hour and how to prepare for them? Uh, the signs of the hour and how to prepare for them. So, um, the signs of the coming of the hour, and we just had two, which are sahih, there's no question about them. Uh, they are very, very many. <clears throat> they fill volumes. Which means that the Prophet Wasallam talked about that a great deal. And he gave it a great deal of attention. And in the signs of the end of time, you have early signs. Okay, those are things that have happened already. The birth of the Prophet وسلم, is one of those. Um, of course, the sending of the Prophet Mab'ath al Nabi is one of those. The death of the Prophet is one of those. Even he says that that his death will be one of the signs of the end of time. <clears throat> um, the conquest of Jerusalem, that is one of the signs of the end of time. That's a good sign. Um, the conquest of Jerusalem. Um, the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab is one of the good signs because he is a door between the ummah and between fitna. And then also we know that the best of all generations um, is the first generation of the Sahaba, then the Tabi'een and the Atba'at Tabi'een. That's a sign of the end of time. But that's a good sign and it's a sign the purpose of which is to give you confidence that you can take your deen from them and it will be sound and it will be safe. Um, <clears throat> And then there will be Ugaylima uh, min Quraysh. There will be little boys from Quraysh who will destroy this religion. That's an early sign. Yazid ibn Muawiyah is the first of them. And the people with him. And they kill Imam al Hussein. And that's one of the signs of end of time. Even Abu Huraira knew the year in which Imam al Hussein would be killed. And he said, Oh Allah, don't let me see that year. And he died the year before it. <coughs> so these are signs <coughs> of the end of time, and they're early signs. And Islam is destroyed by Yazid. But then, 
it is restored by Zayn al-Abidin. Although the wound will last until the Day of Judgment. But Zayn al-Abidin, may God be pleased with him, he restores the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, of Khidma and Muhabba. And he had around him people that he taught as a sheikh and gave them tarbiyah and then he sent them out so that they established that there's no hatred in this religion. There's no vengeance in this religion. After the death of Imam al Hussein, hearts are destroyed. Hearts are ruined. And then Zayn al Abidin gives them life again. But the wound that is there will be a wound that will fester until the end of time. <coughs> so there, there are many signs like that. The khawarij are one of the signs of the end of time. But they're an early sign, but they're a sign that repeats. <coughs> because you have signs that happen one time, such as the birth of your wonderful Prophet Sallallahu But you have signs that repeat. And among the repeating signs is the khawarij. And the khawarij are people who are known by takfir. <coughs> they declare the takfir of the believers. And they are people of violence and rigidity and arrogance and superficial knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ described them and warned against them. And they every time that you destroy one generation of them so they don't they're not always lasting they'll be cut off but then another one will come back until the last of them fight with the Antichrist they will be the soldiers of the Antichrist <coughs> and the Prophet وسلم, described the Khawarij as dogs of hell Kilabu Nar Kilabu Ahlin Nar and ISIS is like that killing innocent people, people that will go into a mosque and kill all the believers. What are you? Dogs. You know, you had this unfortunate incident uh, just a short time ago, right? So the man wants to blow up mosques and he kills innocent people. I'm sorry. Dog of hell. The Prophet warned us about this very much. Then you have middle signs. <coughs> you have signs that come from between the middle and the end. <coughs> and one of those is a volcano that will appear in Hijaz. And its light will be seen in Syria at nighttime so that you could see its lights shining on the necks of the camels in Basra or Busra in the city of Basra, in the desert of Syria. Did that ever happen? Yes, it happened. <coughs> and that is a great volcano that erupted just outside Medina. Um, when you go to the airport in Medina, you'll see this thick lava flow that is as tall as from the ground to the rafters, and sometimes taller. Many of you, you've seen it, haven't you? I've seen it many times. It's right out there where the airport is. And it's very thick. Okay, that is the lava flow of that volcano. And that volcano... <coughs> um, was expected to consume all of Medina. And one geologist who went with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to Medina looked at it and he said, how in the world could this ever have been stopped? It should have gone all the way to the Prophet's mosque, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But all the people went to the mosque and they prayed and they cried and they prayed and they cried and it, it stopped. But the light from that volcano was so bright that in Syria you could write books at night time. You could read books at night time. And indeed you could see the reflection of it on the necks of camels. So that's a sign. And is it a good one? Uh, I don't remember dates and I don't have my notes. I speak from a computer. 
And when I don't have my computer, I'm in a sad situation. But that volcano happened uh, just before the Mongol destruction of Baghdad. The destruction of Baghdad at the hands of the Mongols comes about two years after that. And in fact, the Mongols had appeared before that, Genghis Khan. But in fact, uh, the people of Medina wrote to the people of Baghdad, and they say, get ready for trouble. So they knew it was an ominous sign. And uh, you have many middle signs. And I'm going to pull out the one I like the best. وَيَنْشُرُ qalam, وَيَظْهَرُ qalam. Okay, this is one of the middle signs. Pins will be everywhere. You have a pin, you have a pin, you have a pin. I bet you have a pin. Do you? Okay. And you've probably got three or four. And probably you've got decorated ones and cute ones. And, and I've got ones I like. I'm really particular about pins. I don't like all pins. It's got to write a particular way, you know. But pins will be everywhere. Knowledge will be accessible everywhere. And uh, the Prophet told us about airplanes. He told us about automobiles. He told us about oil and the oil wealth and the oil wars. And he told us about many things. Um, he also told us that at the end of time, former enemies of Islam <coughs> would begin to enter the faith. And this is something we see happening right now. Of course, you have Europeans, and I'm of European background, uh, who are coming into Islam. And our ancestors were not necessarily your friends, you know. And uh, then you have also people like uh, the Mongols of Genghis Khan. And now you have many Mongols embracing Islam, which really displeases the Mongolian government because they don't like Islam. And you have tribes in Africa that have been, you know, bitterly opposed to Islam and Christianity <coughs> for centuries, who are now coming in by the hundreds. So that's one of the signs of the end of time. And Islam will spread everywhere. There will be no place where the message of Islam is not known. Um, there's another one, is, which is, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ مَكَّةَ قَدْ uh, if you see Mecca having been gutted بُعِجَتْ with tunnels. Okay, I made pilgrimage the first time in 1973. Uh, that was a beautiful Hajj. It was December 1973, January 1974. You weren't even born then. You know? And uh, it was a beautiful pilgrimage. And I did it on foot. I was a poor, and I was living in Cairo in those days. I was studying at AUC. Um, my wife had given birth to our first baby, Iman. And in fact, we had a really dear Egyptian sister who loved us very much. And she said, it's got to be Iman. It's got to be Iman. So we named her Iman. It's a beautiful name. <coughs> and, uh, but the doctor, uh, Dr. Muhammad Fayyal, who was very well known, I think he's passed now. Allah have mercy on him. Uh, he did it for free. He didn't charge me anything. Even though it would have, you know, it would have been a reasonable price, but he said, no, no. He said, I do this lillah. Thank God bless him. <clears throat> and so I took that money and I made pilgrimage from Egypt on Egypt air. <laughs> and, um, mashallah, you know, but... There were no tunnels. There wasn't in Mecca a single tunnel, right? And it was, it, it, it is always beautiful. <clears throat> but um, you could walk up on the mountains and I'm going to guess that there wasn't a single building towering over the mountains. There might have been, but I didn't notice any. Because most of the buildings were old buildings from the 1800s, the 1700s. You know, beautiful, built with these different colored bricks. And so when you see Mecca gutted with tunnels, and you see tall buildings towering over the mountains, then expect the hour. Okay, that's a sign 
of the end of time. But that's a middle sign. And you have many, many others. Um, the prophet told us all of a sudden about colonialism, imperialism. He told us about people like, um, you know, what's his name? The ruler of Mecca that uh, cooperated with Lawrence of Arabia. He's not mentioned by name, but you know, in some of the hadith about, uh, you know, the fitan, ad dahma you know, then it talks about a man who thinks he's of Ahl Bayt, of Ahli Bayti, you know, and he will do these things with the enemy. So um, you have many things like that, and then you have al fatratul Huthaiya, al fatratul Huthaiya. Uh, the time <clears throat> when, uh, God forgive us, Muslims will be like They'll be like the foam on the top of the gushing rainwater. I mean, I hate to say that. Don't you hate to hear that? But then look at us today. Look at us today. You know, and uh, we are in a very desperate state. But the Prophet said that. You'll be like that. And you have other signs like Ummatik al Matar. La yudra awwaluha khayrun aw akhiruha. My Ummah is like the good rain that brings life to the earth. It will not be known, maybe not even on the Day of Judgment, when they weigh the books, which is better, the first or the last. Because there will be, in the end of time, beautiful men and women, brothers of the Prophet who will bring this religion back to life. That's a miracle, isn't it? And it's a miracle of the Prophet And how can that happen? You know that's impossible. And I know it's impossible. But I know Allah can do the impossible. You know, and we believe we, are, we have a shaykh who is a specialist in the impossible. You know, so um, that will happen. And then you know the hadith about ikhwani, when the Prophet وسلم, said, Ishtaqtu ila ikhwani. I yearn for my brothers. And the Sahaba said, um, We are your brothers. Because they want him to be happy. He said, No, you're my ashab. You're my companions. My brothers are a people who will come later who didn't see me. And they would give anything just to see me. And they will have the rewards of 70 of you companions. 70 of you. And then one of them asks, uh, of us or of them? And I'm glad he did because we want to be sure. And he said, of you, the companions. They say, Lima ya Rasulullah, how can that be, O Messenger of God? And he said, because you have helpers. They will have no helpers. Do you have helpers? Do you have helpers? I mean, I believe that you and I are quite fortunate. But I know that most Muslims are not. The one who's supposed to help you will betray you. The one who's supposed to guide you will misguide you. The one who's supposed to lift you up will put you down. The one who's supposed to protect you will turn you over to harm. And we live at a time, brothers and sisters, you be strong. When false sheikhs appear every day. And this breaks our hearts. This breaks our hearts. It's like every other hour. And people that know this can't be true of him. But then she said he did it. 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 The patterns repeated dozens of times. And then you begin to say, oh my God, like, there were indications all along. But I didn't have the sense to see it. Okay, so you have a helper? That's help? Now you'll be struggling to keep your faith. Right? You will. This is happening to us. You know, this is happening to us right this minute. 
right this minute. And, you know, so you have no helpers. <clears throat> but inshallah, we will help each other. And there's only one thing that I ask of you, and only one thing I ask of myself. Let us be honest. Let us be truthful. Let us be people who don't break the trusts. And you can do that, right? And if you can, you can do that, you are the winner. And may we find all the people who are umana, all the people who are trustworthy. And I believe I'm looking at many of them, some of them, and there are others as well. I know brothers like a Dutch Muslim, for example. Uh, God forgive me for mentioning his his nationality. You know who is one of the most beautiful people you will ever see. But before Islam, he was on the verge of suicide. He was on the verge of suicide. Even though he's extremely intelligent, he's extremely learned, he's extremely gifted. Okay, but Islam saved his life. And now he gives everything to this deen. And his wife, and he wouldn't betray anything. I believe that. And his wife is the kind of person that <clears throat> I don't think it's possible for her to betray a trust. And you know people like that, don't you? You know people like that. That's the people we have to be. You don't have to know a lot. You don't have to have studied for years. Just be honest for God's sake. Just be truthful for God's sake. Don't betray trusts. That's what's needed right now, is amana. Amana. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So, they will have no helpers and therefore you, and you suffer. And I know you suffer. And sometimes these things hit us so heavily. I mean, sometimes I feel like this doesn't bother me anymore. I've seen it too many times, but it does. It does. It crushes you. Right? It crushes you. So, we don't have any helpers, do we? And that's why we have to help each other. You know, we're like orphans. And we will stand by each other. We will help each other. So you have middle signs. <clears throat> and then you have end signs. And the end signs begin with the Mahdi. And the Mahdi is a real man. Okay, and his name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and he's from Ahli Bayti Rasulillah But he's preceded by many Mahdi's. So you have to know that. Imam al-Maturidi, who is one of the great scholars of Islam, and he's one of the great scholars of Usul and Maqasid. In the Hanafi school, he stands out. Ma'akhid al-Shara'i'a. In other words, he was called Mahdi Zamanihi. He was called the Mahdi of his time. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani also. And is he the Mahdi? No, he's not the Mahdi. <clears throat> but he, will, he belongs to the army of the Mahdi. And he sets things right. He removes doubts. He gets things together. <clears throat> and when the Mahdi comes, the Muslims will be okay. Not like now. He won't come in a time like this. This is not the time of the Mahdi. You know, when he comes, the Muslims will be all right. They will be those brothers. They will be that rain, that fresh rain. Okay? And when the Mahdi ha comes, there's very little time left. And all the rest of the signs, they come like pearls on a necklace that's been cut, falling off. So it's just two or three years, and the world's over. Two or three years. And then you have, when the Mahdi comes, the Dajjal, the Antichrist. Now the Antichrist is preceded by many Antichrists, just like the Mahdi is preceded by many Mahdis. And <clears throat> you can look at many people, um, no need to be calling names, you know, but you can look at many people in our time, <laughs> the 19th century, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, 
um, Mao Tse Tung. Uh, we could name some Muslims, but I don't really want to do that. You know, um, Ataturk, for example. You know, they are Dajjals. They are Dajjals. They belong to the army of the Dajjal. And many people today do too. Like the president of my country, for example. These are evil people. They're evil people. And they do the work of the Antichrist. And look at the movie industry. You know, you know, in, in the end of time, people give up principles and they adopt ideals and false universals. And they give up justice and they adopt sentimentalism. Sentimentalism. Okay, and this is one of the main things, you know, that false politicians and others do. Sentimentalism. And, you know, if we know the history of the Nazis in Germany, I know that pretty well. Sentimentalism is the key. This is a piece of German earth. The little girl comes as she comes up to Hitler with her bouquet of flowers. The Saarland, the Saargebiet is now Deutsch. You know, so this is a piece of German earth. And the Germans all cry, right? That's sentimental, sentimentalism. And they did that, they played that for decades. Um, and we see it in movies. You know, like, uh, for example, um, oh, let's just take one that's maybe not that bad. And that's the Titanic. Okay, the sinking of the Titanic was one of the biggest signs of God of the 20th century. Okay, and we used to talk about nothing but that. And I used to always tell my students about the Titanic. You know, and, you know, we would, like, look at this sign of God. This huge ship, the man who built it, he says, it cannot sink. Even God can't sink it. <clears throat> and it sinks on its first maiden voyage. That's not a sign of God? It is. And then you take that incredibly powerful story and you turn it into a story of adulterous love. Adulterous love. That's what he did. That's all false. It's all made up. But it's all extremely sentimental, right? Jack! Jack! You know? As he disappears. And then in the end of the story, she throws her little diamond, whoops, you know, into the Atlantic. And then she dies and she goes down to the ship and there's a big party. And you're crying. And I'm crying. And I'll cry before you do. I'm the most sentimental of them all. I'll be the first to cry. But that's sentimentalism. And so everything that she stands for and everything that Jack stands for which includes adultery, you know, it's not that bad. See how they do? And you could get a lot of other examples. And that is Antichrist. And that's not the worst example, because that is a pretty good movie, <laughs> right? But there are others that are not so good. So I'm sorry that you're cold. <laughs> Um, so you have signs of the end of time, and those signs are the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is real, and he has to appear because the Mahdi is there. Otherwise he works behind the scenes. And when he appears, the natural order begins to break down. Yes? No, but I'm... Why? Well, you want me to lose my citizenship? <laughs> no, but I, I'm German, I'm German, and in my country it's mm -hmm. legal that homosexual people mm -hmm. marry and even adopt children. Yeah. And this is something for me unacceptable. Well, in any case, God bless you, but, um, you know... Uh, do, we, do we deal with this? I mean, like, yeah, in any case, that's a big question. And that's a dangerous question, because if I say the wrong thing, I can't go to England anymore, and I can't go to Germany anymore, and I can't go to Australia or New Zealand, because I have hate speech. And, you know, so we have to be careful, because 
People might post it on Facebook. Do you know what Dr. Amor said? Okay, no visa. And, uh, but I was going to give an example of movies, right? Okay, she's shaking her head, she knows what I'm talking about, and I'm not going to say. But, you see, it's all sentimentalism that makes you say, this can't be that bad. Come on. Yeah. You know, so, um, they work on sentimentalism. That's really, really important. And with the Antichrist, the natural order begins to break down. And then comes the beloved, majestic Christ, the Tiger. Jesus Christ. He comes back the second time. And when he comes back, the Mehdi, you know, is defended. Because the Mehdi will have a hard time with the Antichrist. And then Jesus comes back, and the Dajjal, the Antichrist, begins to melt. And the main thing the Antichrist does is Dajjal. Which means you do Qalbul Haqqaiq. You turn things upside down. Black is white, white is black. Good is bad, bad is good. Um, we had our Zawiyah, which some of you were able to attend. I wish we could have all been there. But we would have had to have a Titanic. <clears throat> and I don't think it would do that well in the Nile. I don't know. But, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the Zawiyah, we talked about how in the last few hundred years, the way we think, the values we hold, all of these things have been, in many cases, fundamentally changed. And sometimes in ways that you wouldn't think are serious. But they are serious. Little things like getting rid of the concept of essence. And you might not even know what that means, essence. But essence is what you're referring to when you say, I, me, myself, that's your essence. And so you get rid of the essence and then you have the dominant theory or whole perspective of the time, which is nominalism. That things are just the collection of their parts. So you are a name. You're not an essence. That doesn't sound so serious, does it? But it is. That's really serious. All metaphysics, all definition, all first principles out the window. And not only that, um, you know quantum physics? Quantum physics that studies subatomic particles? The subatomic particles are weird. And it's like they live. And it's like they make choices, and they're unpredictable, right? And you have certain paradoxes, like we have one that's called a cat, Schrodinger's cat, okay, who's both alive and dead at the same time. That doesn't make any sense, does it? But they can't solve that. Why? Because there's no essence. If you put essence back into your worldview, you can solve that problem. That is a nominalist world, that cannot understand, because this problem is metaphysical. So that doesn't sound like a big thing, but actually it is. And actually some people would say it's the biggest thing. One person is Richard Weaver, who is a very brilliant American thinker. So the, the, the Dajjal, he does things like that. Get rid of essence, you don't see it, it's not there. And you don't think that's serious, but it is, and he knows it is. He turns things upside down. That's why when we teach Aqidah, you know, we have to teach people how to think. How do you know the truth? How do you know what is true? And then you have Gog and Magog, yet Juj and Matjuj. And what do they do? They kill all the followers of the Antichrist. That they all the followers of the Antichrist, they kill them all. And they're and they're not real. I mean they're real, but they're unreal. But the natural order is not working anymore. The world's at the end. It's not like the world you knew. And ultimately the sun will rise in the West. 
That's not like the world you knew. And the Gog and Magog will try to get you too. But you have to be protected. And you'll be protected by Jesus Christ. He will protect you. And then they will be destroyed. And then you have other things. Uh, the rising of the sun in the west. The beast of the earth. Uh, you have a rih al You have the nice breeze. You know, that soft as silk and sweet as musk. And the night that that comes, no believer will be alive in the morning. All believers will be gone. Then you have the taking away of knowledge, the taking away of the Qur'an. Of course, you won't have any believers reciting it anymore, but some say even the letters will be taken out of the Mus'hafs. You have the destruction of the Kaaba. The Kaaba will be destroyed, and it's an Ethiopian that will lead that. And why does he destroy the Kaaba? Because there are no believers anymore, so why does he care? Gold because there's treasure beneath the Kaaba. So this is what he believes, and many people do believe that. I don't know if it's true or not, and to me it's not important. But he will destroy the Kaaba to try to get the treasures that are beneath it. And he doesn't care. It's not like, I'm doing this because, you know, there's no Muslims anymore, I'm sorry. No one is doing Tawaf anymore. And people, some people even go back to idolatry. And there'll be no believers, and they will do horrible things, and then the hour will come. But, you know, once the Mahdi appears, the time from then until the blowing of the trumpet is a short time. It's just a few years. So don't think it's happened already, because it hasn't. This is not the time of the Antichrist. This is not the time of the Mahdi. Okay, this is a time before that. And when will it happen? Well, we don't know, do we? But the, but the most important thing is you learn from the sign of the end of times that there is an order of good and there is an order of evil. So where do you want to be? The order of good. And I think that this is a representation of that order that we hope that, don't we? That we are part of the order of good. We're not the order of good, because it's so much bigger than we, but we are part of that. So you have to be in the order of good. <clears throat> and there is an order of evil, and you don't want to be in that. And every prophet from Adam warned of the Antichrist. Why? It's a long time coming. And that's because the order of evil, which is the work of the Antichrist, is there always, from the beginning. You know, Adam and Eve give son to, give birth to, Kabil. And what does he do? He kills his brother, Habil. Right? And here in Egypt you have, you know, Osiris and Isis, and you have Sit, the brother, you know, of Osiris. Osiris is, is first born, and Sit is born before him. And Sit, you know, wants to have his wife, who's Isis. She's very beautiful. She's the goddess Isis, not that stupid group that was there in Syria, right? And, and that's one of the things that I hated about them, is they slandered the name of Isis, uh, really, because Isis is very important in history. And now you have Hotel Isis and, and, and Aswan, and people are going to call the police, right? You know, have an ISIS hotel. Um, but, you know, Osiris um, is like Habil, and Sit is like Kabil. And in fact, in our stories, uh, the story is very, very similar. You know, that Kabil wanted to marry his own sister. Because Adam and Eve always gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. So you can't marry your twin, that was forbidden. But you'll have to marry a sister, because it's the beginning. Okay, and many ancient people believe that too. The same thing, that that's the way it was. And that's also Egyptian mythology, the same thing. So he, his twin is very beautiful. And she will be the wife of Habil. And so he kills Habil to marry her. That's one of 
the Bible tells a different story, and you know, there can be different stories, but uh, that's the order of evil and the order of good from the very beginning. And it will recur like that over and over again. What do you do? You do dhikr. What do you do? You do tawbah. And the Prophet taught us that. That when you see these signs, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا When you see these signs, like tunnels in Mecca, doesn't mean that the hour is going to be in the next 24 hours. But when you see that, do lots of dhikr. And do tawbah. And, you know, one of the signs of the end of time is your and my death. In khuwaysa tu nafsik, your little special thing, which is death. And when we die, God bless us and give us long and good lives, then it's the day of judgment. Day of judgment is here, you know, for you and for me. Um, I like that question, as you can see, and I took too much time, but I enjoyed every minute. And inshallah, what's the next question? So uh, let's ask let's ask Leila first. Okay. Uh, many of us have been wondering about the advice for the upcoming month of Rajab. Mm -hmm. no, no, don't ask that question. Don't ask that question. You ask that when Sheikh Muhammad comes. Wow. Okay, that's for him. Okay, will you do that? It's a very good question, but I'm not good at things like that. He would know exactly what to do. Yeah, that's a good question. We're in Rajab now, by the way. We're in Rajab, which is a sacred month. Yes. Yes, go ahead. This is more a very personal question. Um, but something I, I struggle with myself at this, this moment. Last year I... Put the microphone uh, oh, sorry, to you. Last year I, um, yeah. I, came, I came closer to Allah and to, my, uh, mm. to Islam very, very, very much, like never before in my life, like spending hours and hours in mosque mm. and praying and all of this. Mm. And I was praying a lot, a lot, a lot for quite a few things. And then I see mm. people around me who uh, are not faithful or who don't, mm. don't believe in Allah that much and don't do anything and they get what I pray for. So at the moment, mm -hmm. yeah, I really have a lot of question marks and, and, and I don't know how to continue doing what I have done in that intensity. Can you help me? Um, well, you know, we, we, we must worship Allah for His sake. Must worship God for His sake, and because it is His right to be worshipped, and because it's beautiful to worship Him, and we can worship Him because we want things. Uh, of course, we do want the garden, and we don't want the fire. But when we worship Him, you know, for things, you know, like I'll be successful and we'll make money and have a good career and my enemies will all be destroyed and you know then um, it's like we are hirelings hirelings we're like hired men and women we're like maids and butlers that I work for you but you pay me and you didn't pay me I'm not working one of the ancient Egyptians you know they used to go on strike <coughs> they did lots of work you know how they would go on strike they go to their work and they just sit. They just sit. They don't say anything. They don't break any windows. There weren't many windows to break, you know. But they just sit there and if you want the work done, you pay them. That was pretty intelligent, I think. But, um, <clears throat> you know, inshallah, whenever you make a dua to God, whenever you pray to God, he will give you what you ask for. Okay, and part of the adab of dua is that you have certainty that He will answer your prayer. And when we don't have certainty that He'll answer our prayers, then this is bad adab. Fad'uni, astajib lakum. Call upon me, I will answer you. 
So you have to be certain he will answer you. Will he give you what you want? Maybe. Maybe not. Either he will give you that or give you something much better. Will he give it to you tomorrow? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not even in this world. But then, the more that he puts it off, and the more that he changes it, the better it will be. And for that reason, it may be when you go back to Allah, you may wish that he never answered a single prayer. You know, because the ones he didn't answer, my God, look what I got. And you pray for something, and maybe tomorrow you say, why did I ask for that? It turned out to be so bad. <clears throat> so be patient, and you know, God gives to all. He's a rahman This is his mercy. And he gives to the good and the bad, doesn't he? Not just the believers eat breakfast, you know, and some believers don't get breakfast at all, and some non-believers don't either. But God gives to everyone, you know, so he's very generous. And, moreover, a lot of times with the disbeliever, they've got to get everything here, because they've got nothing there. So God, yu'ajil, he speeds up their rewards, because many of them, God guide them and God guide us, they don't have any reward in the next world. So all the good they do needs to be rewarded here. So you get this, you get that, you get a nice big house. Um, I pray that God guides my country men and country women. Um, but if you go to my country or you go to our brother Benjamin's country, Germany, or you go to other countries, people have big houses, don't they? They have beautiful houses, don't they? They have, of course, the poor don't. But you have neighborhoods, you just go on and on. It's like the houses are all palaces, aren't they? And sometimes I look at that and say, I hope to God that you'll have a palace in the next world. I wish to God that you would be guided so that this palace can be a little palace and you have a big one waiting. But many of them, it won't be like that. This was your palace, now you have none. So God always gives the disbelievers because of their disbelief. He's very kind. He's very merciful. So you did good, good, you get now the reward. Your punishment, maybe it doesn't come here. It will come someday and it will be very great. For us, often, we may even be punished here so that there's no punishment later on. So, inshallah, be in love with your Lord. Be in love with your Lord and rely on Him and take what He gives you and be happy. Be idhni lahi ta'ala. Yeah. Okay, let's take a question. And we'll come back to Allah later, okay? Hmm. Those are two questions, but they're closely related. So the first one is, how do we choose the right partner for marriage and how do we face the fear of commitment and how to understand men? That's the first one. The second one is, many of us find it hard to find a suitable spouse. So how do you suggest we deal with the frustration of waiting so long to finally meet them? Or how do we best deal with the reality that we may never be married and have children without falling into despair and loneliness? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's a really good question. and. Um, and looking for a spouse, uh, of course you have many things that you naturally look for. There are particular types of people that you're attracted to and others that you're not. And naturally you like certain things and you don't like other things. And that's your right to do that. But the most important thing in a spouse is, and in you too, <coughs> is that you have good character. That's the most important thing. And good character means, of course, that you are honest, you are humble, you are trustworthy, you are courageous, you are generous, you are modest, you know, all good character. 
but good character <clears throat> always is based on two things. All good character, it comes out of two qualities. The first of those is tawadu, is humility. <coughs> humility, <coughs> that you don't put yourself up, you put yourself down. When you have tawadu and you put yourself down, all good begins to happen, even haqaiq tatajalla. And when you put yourself on, al-haqaiq, um, yani mahjubah. When you put yourself up in you know, all the realities, they will be hidden from you. They will be veiled. So you want to be humble. And you want your spouse to be humble. And then, ethar. That you prefer all other people over yourself. All other people. You don't see that you're better than anyone. And you are happy to pay back your debts because other people have a right to their money, right? You know that some people, to pay back a debt is harder than having open heart surgery, right? They, they don't want to do it. They don't want to pay their bills. But if you have ethan, no, I want to because that's your right. You gave me this money, I want to give it back to you. Um, I want to pay the bills. I use this stuff. I have to pay for it. That's all the spirit of ethar, of preferring others over yourself. So when you have those two things, tawadu and ethar, humility, and preferring others over yourself, then all other good character will be there. It will have a place to grow. And without them, it will not. Okay, and uh, Iman and Kufr, they are the twins of good character and bad character. The, good char the twin of good character is Iman. Why? Because when you believe, don't you have Tawadra? Right? When you stand in prayer and you bow and you pray and you do Rukur and Sujood, isn't that Tawadra? It's teaching you tawadu, and it breeds tawadu in you, and you want to have that tawadu. You want to have that modesty. And isn't iman, ethar, that you know you prefer God over everything, and you recognize His right upon you, as ethar is also recognizing the rights of others. So you recognize the rights of others. And this is why when you look at the Sahaba, who are the best of all people ever created, who were not prophets, they were very generous. They prefer others over themselves, even in dire need, even when they're starving. I will give you the food. You know, and even as you know in the Battle of Uhud, when this person went around giving water to the wounded, and each one would say, no, you give it to my brother first. You give it to my... And then he comes back and that one's dead now. That one's dead now. So they, they you know, you give it to him first. He needs it more than I. And those are not made up stories. That, that's a reflection of people who have extremely good character. When you, when you have good character, then Iman is natural to you. And the twin of Kufr is bad character. Arrogance, pride, and preferring yourself over everyone. Narcissism. Okay, and what is kufr? Kufr is that yatakabbar. You know, the person is proud. He's too proud to worship God. You know, I, I know people who the idea of prostrating themselves on the earth is unthinkable. They wouldn't bow <clears throat> to anyone. And then to put my head on the ground? But you don't think I have pride? You don't think I have honor? No, I mean, you should be modest. You should be humble. You should be able to do this. He's your creator, for God's sake. You know, and then you prefer God's rights over yourself, don't you? So you're able to fast. 
and you're able to, to live a life that's halal and you're able to avoid the haram. And when in the Qur'an Allah tells us about the kufr of uh, Abi Jahl or Abi Lahab or He tells us about the kufr of the Jews of Medina, He always tells us about their character, doesn't He? That they lie, they cheat, they break their trusts, they oppress orphans, they oppress widows. You know, he's masha'an binamim. You know, he walks around spreading calumnies and slanders. Okay, and why? Because that character explains to you why they can't do this, why they can't be honest with you, and they can't recognize the truth, and they can't be honest with God. So, and you want good character. And um, I, I, that's what I feel. And, you know, may other people can have other ideas. But to me, because marriage is about character. And, you know, living with your wife or your wife living with you. There's all sorts of problems, you know that, in the best of men and women. And there's no way that you can solve those problems without, you know, good character being able to control your anger, being able to say, I'm sorry, I did this, uh, you know, being a really good human being. And that means manhood. Because manhood is not being, you know, uh, you know, tough and rough and uh, I don't listen to anybody, even though that's what we think many times. But manhood is about being generous, and about being gracious, and about being giving and so forth and uh, today these are things that are very important and womanhood as well you know so uh, now the other part of the question was about the difficulty of getting married and it was stated in such a way that it emphasizes the woman you know that we're not going to get married you know, and uh, I mean, I, I know so many sisters. I know some, I don't know if I should mention them, I won't buy the name. But I, I know some, you know, from my own city in America, who all just took a trip, you know, this Christmas vacation, uh, to celebrate together because they're now past their 40s, never been married, and in some cases probably no hope of getting married. So they said, well, let's just love each other and we'll go have a good time and we can joke and we can enjoy the place they went to. It's kind of nice, isn't it? And yet, maybe it should make you cry, actually. Because I swear, every one of those women would have been a really good wife. You know, would have been a really good wife. And yet, she never got married. So that's really hard, isn't it? But then also, those of you who were in the sohba that we had yesterday with Dr. Muna Al-Hassan, you know, she said something really beautiful because she talked about that, that also we do put too much emphasis on marriage because we have a culture in which it's like that's everything, getting married and having children. And um, sometimes women don't get married. Who was the husband of the Virgin Mary? You know, who is the greatest of all women who ever were? And she was never married. And she didn't complain either. And she was complete you know, in that life. And also you look at Asia, here in Egypt, who was one of the most beautiful, wonderful women. Perhaps she was from Luxor. Um, I would, that would be my guess because roughly speaking, Ramses and his, or his son or his grandson of Luxor, those were the pharaohs of Moses. It, it's a good guess, we don't know for sure. But maybe Moses was in Luxor, I'm sure he was there but maybe he was even born there. And, you know, maybe that's where Asiya was too. And 
that's not that important, but Asiya was a wonderful woman. <clears throat> and from the time that she took in Moses, and, and she learned from Moses' mother, and she believed, and you had, you know, min ali fir'aun. You had believers of the house of Pharaoh in the house of Pharaoh, who, as the stories tell us, if they revealed their belief to Pharaoh's daughter, they would be killed, they would be tortured and killed. So they had to hide it. Yaktumu imanahu. They had to hide their faith. And she has to hide her faith too. And she has to do it very, very astutely. Because Pharaoh will abuse her. He is very abusive. He's very violent. And then you know, in the end she's killed. She is the victim of the worst kind of spousal violence you could ever imagine. So, um, what's important for you is to be where you are right now and to be the best you can be right now and of course you want to get married and of course you want to have a good husband and there are du'as that you can make for that and you should make them every day and God give you what you want God give you a good spouse and a good marriage but it may not be and you should be complete anyway and you should be happy anyway and there are men who never get married too there are some men who, for whatever reason, they can't get married if they don't get married. And they can be the best of men, despite that. So, we do want to get married. That's a norm for us. It's very important. But also, in the end of time, it becomes very difficult. Marriage becomes very difficult. And I think the, the most um, saddening of all things is... When you see a woman who really wanted to get married, and then she did, and the husband turns out to be a complete mess, and now she is in greater pain than she was by herself. And, you know, and this really affects us a lot, doesn't it? <clears throat> you know, if we were a good, normal, living community, which I hope that we will help to foster. But marriage should be relatively easy, and marriage should be properly developed, and marriage should succeed. We need to have a culture of sound marriage. And, um, and, and another thing too, is that most men and women need to be taught how to live a married life. Even though you don't think so, and you're probably even offended that I would say such a thing. But most men don't know how to be husbands. They don't. <clears throat> and some women don't know either how to be a wife. So we need to be taught. And, and that's not surprising, is it? Because <clears throat> human beings have to be taught everything. You know, we, we, are, we have instincts, of course like nursing the mother's breast when we're born, you know, but most of our instincts are very limited. We have to be taught everything, don't we? And believe me, especially in this time, you have to be taught how to be married. In a lot of traditional cultures, that wasn't really required. And we still have some cultures like that in the Muslim world, where the family is so vibrant and so big, extended families, but good ones, that you know how to be married because you grew up with your mother and father and your uncles and your aunts and, and they had good marriages. Of course, in many Muslim countries, that's not the case. They have bad marriages, but there are some countries, you know, where <clears throat> marriage can be usually, let's not say usually, but often very, very good because they know from childhood how to live with a wife or the wife knows how to live with a husband. They don't have to be taught much, but we do. We do. Uh, and a lot of us are not very socially intelligent, right? The president of my country is a social idiot. Right? No social intelligence. A narcissist. All he cares about is himself. Nothing else. Doesn't care about the United States. 
You know, he doesn't care about the world, no. He, he would take everything from him for himself he can get, and he cares about nothing else. You know, that's, that's, but a lot of us are that way. A lot of our husbands are that way too. And, uh, you know, God, and, and, and this is why also it's important for us to develop a culture where we have counsel. Uh, you know, a din nasiha. This religion is nasiha. But you don't want to be counseled when it comes to marriage, do you? You don't want anybody to take you and your wife to the counselor. That's such an embarrassment. But sometimes that's what saves the marriage. You have to have good counselors. And also we need to listen to what they say. Yeah. How are we coming for time? Yeah. Uh, something to drink would be good. If it's hot. Yeah. yeah Should we take right. a question from the yes. side? Yeah, sure. Do the men have a question? No. Nope. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> Benjamin, do you have a question? I'm looking. Okay. Don't go too fast. Yeah, I have. You have a question? Oh my God. Benjamin has a question. Okay. Let Benjamin ask his question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My question pertains to shahawat. Um, yeah. My question pertains to shahawat. So the. Uh, you can explain the word. Maybe appetites. Uh, appetites. Yeah. And how do we think, distinguish between, like, uh, where, where do we pull a border between the appetites or the shahawat that are <coughs> dangerous for ourselves and the normal mm. needs of the body mm -hmm. and the nafs? Okay. Um, <coughs> well, this is a, a nice question. Jazakallah kula khair. Um, the nafs is the locus of two qualities, anger and shahwa, anger and appetite. So in your nafs, you have the coming together of anger and appetite. That's the basic nafs. Of course, your nafs can, is many other things, but it begins basically as just that. Anger and appetite, those are its two most distinguished characteristics. And you know that anger is bad, right? Right? No. Anger is good. Anger is created good. Okay? And God created anger for what purpose? You know, to protect you from harm. So the purpose of anger is to give you a mechanism that enables you to stand up to evil and to stand up to harm and to be brave you know in dangerous and difficult situations that's anger so anger is in is an intuition that you have about madarra about harm and it responds with strength i won't have this i won't accept this i'll stop it okay so you want to channel your anger and control it so that it's in the right place. That's what's important. And therefore, when we talk about appetite, the same thing pertains to anger. That uh, the anger that you have is a good thing. And we don't want to get rid of it, but we want to get it controlled. We want to get it controlled. And when anger is controlled, then it produces beauty, it produces courage, manliness or womanliness, it produces generosity, it produces neatness. You want to dress nicely, you're, you're concerned about the way you look, you don't want to just walk around in dirty old clothes, shabby old clothes, you want to look nice. That's anger, but that's anger in the right place, okay? Um, and shahwa, appetite, is good. It's created good. And what's its purpose? Jalbul masalih. 
Its purpose is to acquire the benefits that you need. So you need nourishment, and therefore you have to be hungry. And you need water and liquids, therefore you need to be thirsty. <clears throat> and you need to preserve your body temperature. So you have a desire to put on warmer clothing when it's cold. And you have all these needs, right? And um, therefore, appetite is always connected to that. And therefore, also, you don't want to destroy it. You don't want to destroy it. And, you know, when the appetite is in the right place, then it also produces in you balance, temperance, what we call in English, temperance, the ability to balance things out. And it puts in you also things like him, the desire to get things. I want to learn. You know, I want to be a really good Muslim. You know, I want to um, know my Lord. All of that's coming out of appetite. These are good things, you see. And so I want to get it, just like I'm hungry, you know, I'm going to get some food. I'll look for it, I'll find it. So um, the main thing about appetite is that, just like with anger, it has to be under control. And it has to also be directed to the right things. And, <clears throat> you know, anger is also associated with a hatred of pain and uh, appetite is also associated with a love of pleasure so when you're hungry and you have that delicious dinner like we had tonight you take great pleasure in you know the beef and how well it was cooked right and the other dishes as well right you have pleasure so appetite loves pleasure and anger hates pain, okay? Now, pleasure and pain motivate us a lot. But pleasure and pain in themselves are not rational. <clears throat> because, for example, I might have to take some bitter medicine and it's painful. You know, or I might have to, you know, you might have to take a shot, for example a vaccination, and maybe it's painful, but there's good in it. So if we just go by pain, we won't do many things. You have to study to be a scholar or to be a teacher or to be whatever you're going to be, and that's painful. It would be so much nicer just to go to bed. It would be so much nicer just to go out to play, play football, right? But you're going to stay up and read those books? That's painful. So, um, you know, pain and pleasure <clears throat> have got to be controlled. They've got to be controlled. They have the purpose of making you want to get the things that are good and to avoid the things that are harmful. But they've got to be controlled. And <clears throat> so all of these things are that way. And, of course, we know what is acceptable and not acceptable in these things by revelation. That there are certain things we shouldn't do, no matter how angry we get. There are certain things we shouldn't say, no matter how angry we, we get. And there are certain, you know, we shouldn't overeat. There is a hadith, for example, that Ibn Taymiyyah transmits <coughs> about a fat boy in Medina. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said it like that, but uh, an obese boy. He was very obese. He wasn't just fat. He was obese. And he ate a lot. And the Prophet indicated to him in this hadith, which is very interesting, and Ibn Taymiyyah has a lot of things like that, which are very interesting, and you may not find them elsewhere. <clears throat> and the Prophet basically told him that if, and his father, that if he does not begin to control his eating and he dies, it will be suicide. <coughs> he, will be <coughs> he will be held responsible for it. 
you know, so we, we have to not overeat. And the Prophet taught us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to be moderate in all, in what we eat, what we drink, in the things that we do, not to go to excess. And this is also part of the purification of the self, is being able to control our appetite and being able to control our anger. Uh, one of the amazing things about Ramadan is that you know, it gives you the opportunity to cultivate these traits immensely. It's an, and it's an extremely beneficial type of worship, isn't it? <clears throat> and isn't it amazing that we're all happy when Ramadan comes? Even though you're not going to eat all day. Uh, you know, you're not going to sleep a lot of the night. You'll be praying. <clears throat> you know, you're not going to be drinking and it might be hot. And yet when Ramadan comes, we're all happy, aren't we? We're all happy. The whole Ummah is happy. And that's because it's such a great act. And, you know, being able to control ourselves. And it gives us dignity. And it gives us integrity. Thank you very much. How are we coming for time? How are we coming for time? We do. Oh my God. I mean, happy, right? But uh, 40 minutes is a long time. <clears throat> I've got to still talk for 40 minutes. You know, you poor souls. Uh, what's the next question? Yes, Mustafa. Sorry, 10 minutes. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, he thought we were going for two hours. No, it's an hour and a half, okay. <coughs> I wanted to ask about how can a healthy community be grown? And what, mm. and what are uh, mm. uh, the things to bear in mind that could lead to uh, cults? Or Thank you. Thank you. That could lead to? Cults. Like Cults. Uh, wow, what a good question. I need Maimuna to answer that question. And you know who Maimuna is, right? My computer. <coughs> she's got that answer. And she's got the dates and everything. You know, you see how I'm one of these scholars of books? And if I lose my books, I'm in trouble. <coughs> if I lose my computer, I won't commit suicide, but I will not be happy, right? So that, that's a very good question. How do we create community? How do we not create cult? Very good question. Um, first of all, what is it that makes us community? And um, we, we are a little community right here. <coughs> is it because we're all in the same place and the same time? We're all in the same place at the same time, close together. Does that make us a community? No. Because by some freak coincidence, we could have all kinds of other people here, you know, from different nations and different backgrounds and different beliefs and different outlooks. And they could be sitting here just as nicely as you are, but they're not a community. So what makes you a community is that you have things in common that you agree on and that are very essential to the way you view life. You have common beliefs. You have common principles. You have common aspirations. Okay? That's what makes us a community. <coughs> and if we were to go through uh, the group one by one, and say, do you believe this? Yes. Do you believe this? Yes. Do you think this is good? Yes. You'd see that we differ on some things, but many things we agree on. So it is that shared belief and ethics. <coughs> Excuse me. It is that shared <coughs> objectives. This is what makes us a community. And in the end, this is what makes us a society. And in the end, 
This is what makes us a civilization. That's why when you destroy the beliefs and principles and ethics and other things that the people have, you have destroyed their civilization. And this is why many scholars of the 19th and 20th century, among the greatest of them being Arnold Toynbee, the great historian, they said that the West is dead. Toynbee said that. Your civilization is dead. Why? Because all of these values, <clears throat> all of these beliefs, all of these ethical principles that you had that enabled you to put this together and to be a society and a civilization, they are gone. And they were being lost very rapidly in the 19th century. In fact, the history of communism and fascism in Europe in many ways is an attempt to find something that works as an alternative. And that failed. So, you know, this is why you as a little community with shared values and shared goals, you are actually a little seed out of which could grow a great tree. And that tree would be a beautiful society. And it might even be a civilization. And countries like my own, they desperately need that because they won't be able to survive forever. In fact, they may not be able to survive much longer. Somebody's got to give them back meaning Someone has got to give them back principle. Someone has got to restore family. You know, without family, you don't have sanity. Without family, you know, you're in danger of uh, insanity. So um, that's the first thing in community. And we have a lot of goals. Uh, we would love to know Islam and to practice Islam in a way that is worthy of the Prophet وسلم, in a way that is attuned to the depth of this religion, the profundity of this religion, um, its ability to answer all questions. But that's in our tradition, even though many Muslims today wouldn't be able to help you with anything in that regard. Okay, so. That's our desire, to bring that back to life. Um, you know, we talked a couple of years ago in the Zawiya in Spain about the male and female principles. That's our tradition, by the way. Nothing, nothing, we didn't make up any of that. That's profound, absolutely profound. And we need that in this time, especially our sister talked about gender. Okay, so gender, the issue of gender, um, cannot be dealt with intelligently without metaphysics. God created everything in pairs. God made creation engendered. God put gender in creation, in everything. Even the throne of God has, is male principle. The kursi, the footstool, is female principle. Okay, and the kursi with regard to the earth is male principle. And the earth is female principle. Okay, these are things that, you know, are very valuable insights. And, you know, when you talk about gender, you've got to talk about this. You've got to talk about these principles. So, you know, be the change that you would like to see. Um, there should be female scholars. It is fard kifaya that you have women scholars, just as you have m male scholars. That's basic fiqh. You know, fiqh never said that scholar is masculine. No. You have male scholars and female scholars. We've always had great female scholars, like Karima bint Ahmed and like Fatima bint Muhammad of Halab and so forth. Okay? You've got to have female scholars. Uh, who will listen to them? In the greater society, many won't. And I could even name countries where they might be in danger of their lives 
if they were to speak out as scholars, because those are very misogynistic countries. Very. They don't even, in some of those countries, they don't even want women to be taught, much less to be scholars. Okay, that's wrong. That's very wrong. But what can I do about it? You think I could change that? Um, you think you could change that? Not easily. But we can be among ourselves what we would like to see at large. And that's what we try to do. We had the great honor to have Dr. Maryam Shaitani. And we had the great honor to have Dr. Muna Al Hassan. And maybe next year we'll have more. And, you know, was anything they presented inferior to what was presented by the men? Absolutely not. On the contrary. And if you heard Dr. Muna Al Hassan speak, it's like you, that is extraordinary. What she had absolutely extraordinary. And I want to say also that it's also a woman's point of view, because the way she looks at things has about it a positive, feminine principle. She sees things that I don't see, so I need to hear what she says. And so we can do that. We have to create a society that we are free in, <clears throat> free to be what we would like to see people be. And that can actually be quite successful. How do you not have cult? Okay, so that, that's a really good question. How do you have not have cult? And you all know what cult means, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> I know of a so-called Sufi sheikh who actually literally, literally said that he was creating a cult. That I'm, he's cre he actually said that, that he is putting together a cult, and that's kind of what he did. So <clears throat> cults are little groups that are not open to the outside, and they are groups that cut you off from others, especially others who don't agree. And cults are very dangerous. And usually cults have distinctive types of leaders who are often very charismatic and very manipulative and very dominant and uh, they will control you. And cults will often cut you off from other ties. They may even say, and you actually have some so-called sheikhs who will say you shouldn't visit your mother and father anymore. What? Why? Okay, and, and also, you know, you know, when you talk about these extremist groups, the violent extremist groups, they do that too. They cut you off from everything that you relied on before. And like the elders or the teachers that you had who would tell you that this is wrong, they'll cut you off from them very effectively. He's not a good Muslim, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he's this, that, or the other, because they don't want you to go to him or her, because he would say, that's crazy what you're doing. And then they have usually a charismatic leader, and he takes over, and you become focused on him. And therefore, you can create people who, as it were, are sort of under a spell. <clears throat> and a lot of them are that way. They're not thinking anymore. They're essentially insane. And, and they're doing things that no rational person would ever do. But that's because they don't have rationality. And they've been cut off from all the props of rationality. Um, <clears throat> so... Cults are very dangerous, and we don't want to ever be a cult. And therefore, in our group, for example, we are conscious of that fact. And for that reason, um, the sheikh does not like to call him, he never calls himself a sheikh. He doesn't even like to be called a sheikh that much, even though we do. They say, here's the sheikh. He lets you do it, but he doesn't like you to talk about that very much. Uh, he doesn't like to talk about tariqah that much. 
He doesn't like us to emphasize the fact that we're Qadiris because that has a cultish tendency. So what about the non-Qadiris? Uh, you know you're very, the Egyptians of you are very humorous people. I wish I could drink the water that you drank. And I, I was here the first time in 1973. And um, some of the jokes I heard Egyptians tell about Egypt, I'll never forget for the rest of my life. We don't have enough time for me to tell you one of them, but, you know, mashallah, God gave you a great gift of humor. And when we went on our trip, you know, we stopped and listened to this one sheikh, you know, and uh, this was in Luxor. And uh, he was so funny. He's so beautiful. And he's a great scholar, by the way, but he's so funny. And uh, he asked us, so, so he said, so you're all Sufis? And I said, we're all Qadiris. He said, <laughs> It's like, you know, I want to kiss him, you know? But see, see how smart he was? It's like, we are Qadiris. And of course, he has nothing against that. But we are Muslims, aren't we? You know, we're not Qadiris to the... And that was just a... A, 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 I think very intelligent lesson from him, <clears throat> and, I, and I took that as, as, as a good instruction for me, that, um, you know, so, you know, you don't want to be stressing, we're qadiris, and so forth, because that tends to divide you from other people, and we don't want to, you know, have cultish behavior among ourselves, like we're better than the rest. And especially after saying what I just said about hope, how we hope to be little seed communities, uh, then we have to emphasize that. Because if you don't cultivate that properly, then we begin to think we're better than everybody else. And for that reason also, our Sheikh has always told us, the door is open for everyone. Everyone is welcome. Whether they're Salafi or Wahhabi or Shi'i, or whatever they may be, you're welcome here. And if you want to listen, we're happy to talk to you. And if you want to learn, we're glad to teach. We don't have enemies. We don't oppress people, and we don't have enemies. And, you know, we would like to benefit everyone. And in fact, I mean, I, I've seen um, people like Salafis, and I don't want to say anything bad about Salafis, and I probably shouldn't have used the word, but um, I've seen them come to us in the Gambia, <clears throat> and they have a very bad opinion about Sufism, and they have a very bad opinion about us, and then when they're around us a little bit, and they hear what we have to say, uh, they actually join, they become one of us. And I've seen that a lot. And I've seen other groups as well. You know, so we want to have the doors open and we don't want to cut you off from anybody. And if you do that, you're going to start a cult. Once you start cutting people off, that is the first step towards cult. Cut them off from the others. And that's why we also say that in honoring our silsila, okay, the silsila is what? Khidma wa mahabba. It is service and love and service and love for everyone, right? Not just for you and me, but service and love for everyone. That's the end of cult. And everyone is a khadim, not a makhdum. That's the end of cult. And that's the beginning of success. And then also, um, uh, let me see, I forgot what I was going to say. I think we're out of time. Um, okay, so we don't want, oh yeah, and the other thing is that you cut the silsila if you cut people off from other paths. You know, so, yes, we are Qadiris, and I love Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jidani. I can't hide it. I love Shaykh Abdul Qadir, he's the king. He's Sultan al Awliya. everybody agrees, the Naqshbandis, the Rifa'is, the Suharawandis, everybody agrees. Okay, but you have to love also everyone else. You have to love the Naqshbandis, and you have to love the Suhrawardis, and you have to love the, you know, Ba'alawis, and everybody. We're one family. 
You know, we're one family. We love them all. And if we cut you off from them, we cut our own silsila. You've heard that many times. It's not the first time you hear that. But that also has the beautiful effect that we don't have a cult. And we don't want a cult. And another thing too, we want you to always have access to everyone in the group. Especially people like the Sheikh or people like myself. You know, and of course sometimes that's difficult because of the number of people. <clears throat> but, you know, we use WhatsApp and that's about all I use actually. Um, I've gotten really lazy. I've gotten to where I don't like email anymore and, and you know, I don't know the other ones. Uh, I know that the president of my country is a twit who loves Twitter, you know, but um, I don't even know what Twitter is. I've never used it once in my life, so you can laugh if you want to. It might be better than WhatsApp, I don't know. But, you know, we have to communicate with each other. And, you know, we want everyone to have access. And everyone to have, and we don't want to have, okay, to see the Sheikh, you have to go through this one, and then you have to go through that one, and then you have to go through this one, and then you have to get a special visa, you know, and a permission slip, and then you can see the Sheikh for five minutes. Okay, so that's not the way we do it. Uh, we like to be open for everyone and you know one of the questions that was asked was about different economic classes and things like that and one of the things that you'll see um, with us God forgive me for speaking about us is that uh, our Sheikh accepts everybody and he has really poor followers and he has oppressed followers and he has people that are in great need. And he is as much for them as he is for others. And he also has followers who don't have needs. They're actually very wealthy. And, you know, mashallah, we have a Zawiya now in the Gambia that's really beautiful on the Atlantic. And that's because of a murid who has money. And he just bought it for us like that. So I'm thankful. I'm more thankful. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know who he is, by the way, or she. I don't know. But they did that. And then you have another murid, you know, whose father passed away, and he has a lot of money. And so he wants to build there a three-story mosque, you know, that will have an auditorium in the top uh, for his father, as Sada Pajaria. Okay, we need people like that, don't we? And I love him, and I love those people. But also, we're here for the poor. And Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani was for the poor. The poor for Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani were kings. And the kings for Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani were poor. You know, and uh, he could sometimes be very difficult on them. But he was for everyone, and we want to be for everyone too. Uh, God bless you all, and forgive me just rambling. And I didn't even let Allah ask her question. And we might tomorrow, maybe, should we promise? No. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Allah muwafiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimatil huda alimna ma yanfa'una wa wafiqna lil'amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'al ma nahnu fihi khalisan mukhlisan li wajhika al-kareem ya rabbil alameen اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار I mean it's so wonderful to be with you again uh, in this beautiful country this wonderful country um, every time I come back I love it more uh, it's really a special place and I don't say that to flatter you because, you know, there's no need to do that. It, it, Egypt is a special place. It really is. And, um, you know, these trips we take also, you just see the tremendous wealth, the tremendous richness that you have of intellect, of knowledge, of history. And uh, God bless this country. And, you know, God save this country. And God, you know, let this country be worth 
be worthy of its best traditions and its best people. And we wish that for all the Muslim world. And we wish that for all the world. Assalamu alaikum.